Yes, thank you for speaking with me today. Um, Mr. Secretary, I hope this doesn't take up too much of your time. My name is uh, Dr. Andrew Michaels. I, I earned my degree at the University of Chicago, Illinois. I am currently employed by the Department of the Navy. Yes. Uh, yes. Married with, uh, yes, three children. Yes, I, I did bring my wallet, my driver's license. I'd like to see that. My social security card. Yes. Okay. I am 46 years old. I was born in. Okay. Yes. I've worked for the Department of the Navy for the last 10 years. What I brought to today was my notes from my earlier um, missions for the Department of Navy on behalf of the uh, President of the United States and the United Nations. Yes. Yes. I have here a photostatic copy of the contract that we signed with Count Orlock. Yes, I'm nervous to. Um, yes, you you all have copies, I see. And uh, the first thing on the agenda is my uh, first mission was to try to make contact with the aliens that were captured at Roswell and uh, you have my notes there that went very well and that's where we got the device that allowed us to do the quantum bubble time travel yes uh, they needed assistance my next mission was the alien race needed assistance with a disease that was genetically killing their species on the molecular level. And uh, I went back in time to find uh, the only known sufferer in modern recorded history of Proteus disease, which happened to be Joseph Merrick. And I received Mr. Merrick inside the time quantum bubble and he allowed me to take DNA samples that I then forwarded to the alien race to stop the disease. Yes. So that mission was successful as well. Uh, we followed up by <coughs> some information that uh, our enemies, the in the Axis uh, Alliance, during World War II, used genetic research on unwilling participants in internment camps to come up with a disease that would kill, uh, similar to a form of cancer, and this is the disease that was introduced to our allies through the alien rept reptilian, reptilioid, uh, reptile type alien. Very, uh, he's gray, six foot eight, I think. I'm six foot three. He's at least five, six inches taller than myself. Yes, we got, gained a little bit of insight from 
um, Adolf Hitler on Joseph Mengele's whereabouts and we pass that on to the Israeli security forces as well as their intentions uh, for wanking the demigod Moloch for the purposes of this recording in a lost city in the ocean. My next mission was that I, I don't consider that a success. I don't, I don't know. I can't put it into words what it was like speaking with him, but I do not consider that mission a success personally on a personal level. Yes, I can physically touch somebody in the quantum bubble. My next mission was to, it's just hard to talk about. I mean, could you imagine sitting face to face with him? I've lost uh, a lot of relatives and uh, one brother and uh, a lot of friends and neighbors, co-workers. It's, uh, it was, it was disturbing. It wasn't, it was not easy to be serious and composed. So it was very, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, I'm okay. My next mission was, with the information we gained, our, my next mission was to speak to Fritz Lang, Fritz Lang's wife, Thea von Harbaugh, who helped create the construct android robot. Uh, Futura, 1925-1926, that they embedded with the soul of Maria, uh, and then in 1935 they sent the creature to the Lost City to awaken Moloch, and uh, yes, we, we can refer to him as Moloch for these uh, proceedings. And uh, she was never seen again. They do not know her fate. But it's believed by Thea von Harbaugh that a timer she put inside Futura was set to stop when she got down into the city. So we believe because Moloch never awoke to destroy the world that Thea von Harbaugh's plan worked. And she is basically... Um, she's just like a, a watch that needs wound. She just stopped working. She just, her spring ran out. Um, that led me to the only known creature that we know of at our disposal that could go into the lost city and not be killed at the sight of Moloch or driven to insanity. Um, the undead vampire Kalmorlach Nosferatu, who I have already passed out his contract. Count Orlok was promised a substantial amount of sustenance, a 99 year moratorium on uh, hunting him I guess is the easiest way to put it and he gets the robot Futura as his bride mate companion for said 99 years and it's uh, a rather elaborate uh, system of watching movies 
put in his castle uh, and cartoons I'm not sure you'll have to look at the addendum it was in his language not mine uh, which was interesting because I didn't think he knew we were coming yet he already had his notes prepared I guess he's a very big fan of Mickey Mouse yes oh and a signed Walt Disney autographed Mickey Mouse photo a picture drawing was also part of the addendum and I'm sure we can come to terms with Mr. Disney on this uh, yes, it has to be signed to Count Orlock. I'm sure if the right politician approached him and uh, as a joke, he would do it. I have somebody approaching him at this time. Uh, we haven't heard back yet. The movie theater was installed. Um, now comes the rather... I'll just try to explain it. My next mission was uh, wasn't a mission at all. I was uh, taken. Uh, I was abducted by a, an alien, the gray alien I had mentioned previously, the enemy of our current ally. Uh, that yes who had worked with the Axis powers and Joseph Mengele in particular he he was with me physically and we had the capability of of touching and making contact in a physical way it, it was it was like a dream it was lucid I think the best way to describe it is I I wasn't drunk or I wasn't out of my mind it was like almost being in a fever um, I've talked to a psychologist and the best we can come up to is it was like it, uh, It's, it's just hard to describe, but if you care to, I could go more into detail on what the experience was like. Thank you for allowing me to try to put into words what it was like to be abducted against my will. meditation and hypnosis as a young man and I must say that nothing prepared my body and my mind for being ripped out of our earthly reality and into an alien world far far across the galaxy I can't describe what it felt like to know I was no longer with my feet on the ground on earth anymore. The air tasted like medicine, too sterile, too clean. like it came from a bottle and not from the atmosphere itself it felt like there was a lot more oxygen in the air I felt a strange sense of euphoria realizing I was high on the gas mixture 
slightly off kilter, slightly out of my wits. And everything came into focus. A large spiral galaxy was spinning before me outside the window of whatever office, laboratory, holding cell, prison, wherever I was. I could not move. Nothing on my body could move. My eyes felt like they were open and they hurt like an air draft was blowing across them and I was unable to close them for comfort or to wash the dust from my eyes. My nose felt flared and itching and I couldn't scratch it. My mouth couldn't move. It, it felt open. It, it must have. I, I, I felt like I could breathe through my mouth. Yet, my tongue was immobile. And I couldn't feel my lungs going in and out. I became aware, as strange as it might sound, of the feeling of wanting to chew gum to work off nervous energy. Yet I was unable to do this. My teeth even hurt. They ached. They ached like that moment when you unwrap a piece of fruit flavored gum and your salivary glands explode with saliva and your teeth ache to just chew down those first few bites of the hard gum and soften it within your mouth. I was experiencing multiple sensations and yet no odors or tastes came to mind. Just the feeling of wanting something and being unable to receive it. My neck started to hurt and twitch from muscle fatigue. And I realized I was trying desperately to turn my head with all my willpower. Yet my neck refused to yield even an inch. And my eyes could only look out what was before me. My feet, my toes, my hands and my fingers. All immobile. Nothing worked. And I became even more aware of this itch across my face, this unrelenting, tickling motion of something walking ever so slightly across the skin of my left cheek. And it was so painful. The pain of a thousand needles of Novocaine coursing into my flesh. That's what it felt like without one bit of strength to reach up and rub away the tickle, the itch. And I slowly became aware because even in my motionless state, Feel my 
skin crawling and I realized he had not taken everything away from me I still had one inch of my senses left I could hear him droning droning his version of the king's English in my ears and that's all I could hear so I thought am I actually hearing this or is it in my mind where, where is it coming from and in this moment of one tiny square inch of my senses, I realized that he indeed was transmitting his thoughts to me. And I knew this because they were not entering my ears. And they were not in my mind's eye as I was visually seeing him, that was an illusion. What I was feeling was more base than that, more prehistoric, more alien than anything I had ever experienced. Deep, deep in the lower part of my mind, My motor functions occur. The part of me that is like his mind still evolved from the reptile. We were forming a communication in the lower reflexive part of our minds. And it was in that space that I felt his violations taking place his probes, the way he reached out and touched me, felt me, examined the hairs on my arm. It was in this flight or flight or fight section of my early brain near the base of my mind that I started to formulate what he was doing to me, how he was pulling blood from me, how he was scraping skin from my body, trimming hair, testing me, inserting pieces of technology to track me, to monitor me, and I don't think he knew that I could feel all of this. I think he thought I was too undeveloped, too stupid, too juvenile a race, a species, a creature, a man, to realize what he was doing to me, turning me into a double agent, his eyes and ears, and I felt in that little tiny one inch of my mind what it felt like to be violated in every inch of my mind, and I could hear him mocking me laughing at me and I could feel him I could feel him I could smell him I could smell what he was and I could smell how clinical everything had to be and I knew then that he had done something to the back of my head, to the back of my brain, and he was 
making contact with me there. And it was like, I don't want to say the word, and I won't say the word. And I won't, I won't, I won't say it. Was there. He was inside my body, mocking me, mocking all of us. Superior. And that's when I realized the image in front of my eyes being projected to me was what he wanted me to see what he wanted me to hear, what he wanted me to feel. And it was in that one tiny moment, in that one tiny square, sugar cube, sweet spot of my emotions, my feelings, that I grabbed on. And I knew that I had to fight back. And I knew I had a way. I had a plan. I could smell him. And I could feel my cheek itching, twitching. My cheek slowly. Closer and closer to the tiny little sensitive spot between my nose and my eye. That tiny triangle filled with millions of nerve endings. All of them exploding one after another as one another of this thing on my face as this thing struck my skin with its legs and this sedate controlled as I was I counted the legs and I counted one He took everything that was human from me, but what he left, my reasoning mind reached deeper and deeper into the feeling on my skin, and my senses cried out to me with all the power of my entire race behind me screaming to me that you have a fly on your face. And then my weapon of choice came into view all across my eye was the beautiful sight of the most written earth bound house fly crawling up into the meniscus of my eye near my tear duct tickling me tickling my eyelashes tickling my eye and I said come on you have to do it make me tear make and then 
tear that struck the fly and caused him to take flight. And what would a fly do in this situation? Why he went from one needy host to another and he landed upon my alien captor's head instantly severing his link to me stopping the experiments and allowing me to break his lock on my mind all of my science all of my strength, all of my knowledge. I used memory tools to remember everything that he did to me, the location of every pin brick on my head, in the back of my skull. And I wished with all my heart and all my strength to hold on to these memories. And his concentration broke his tools thrown asunder, his experiment ruined, this housefly attacked relentlessly, landing time and again, spreading disease and pestilence from one of the worst places on earth, the bowels of a plague-ridden vampire castle onto his pristine, sterile laboratory. And he escaped, and in his escape, his experiment, and my captivity broken, I was returned to Earth, free once again. And I looked around, felt every inch of my body, the blood on the back of my head and the marks in my hairline and the cuts on my neck and I started to weep because I realized on my knees in that horrible filthy Carpathian castle that my friend did not come with me, and I laughed, I laughed as the tears ran down my face and thought to myself, oh God, I hope it wasn't pregnant, I hope to God for your sake, you evil bastard, that fly wasn't pregnant. Here's what we think we can do. He's told us that our atomic weapons are of no value. We think because he kept bringing them up, it's possible he was lying. Now some of our best minds have looked at this information from my uh, interrogation, from my debriefing after I returned. and. What we've come up with is he's either trying to um, basically fool us into thinking atomic weapons don't work. We should try an atomic weapon. It's already too late. When I came back and I was put in the hospital, I did contact the president and told him we have two choices. Two choices told him with with a certain amount of degree of time involved what our intentions were. And the minute we didn't break contact with our alien allies, he immediately knew that we had no intention of of stopping the alliance. Therefore, we can only assume that he is or one of his agents is en route to 
to a lost city, to a wink in Moloch. Our uh, fleet is there. We're not sure how they will be transported there. We don't know how many. and We don't know who his agents are. We do know reasonably well that it is very dangerous or at least hard physically for him to come to the planet Earth. He had what some might call a nervous breakdown when he realized he himself was being touched by a creature from our planet. I'm, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. It was a common housefly. When he transported me, he pulled my physical body into his time bubble, and he brought with him, or with me, a small common housefly. This housefly flew off of my clothes and started to land and light on him. And I'm guessing that though he's highly evolved, he is not immune to disease and a disease carrying common housefly must have either infected him or had the potential to infect him. What we what we do know or what we think is he mentioned two people and he kept mentioning the fact that we weren't an ascendant race. He kept mentioning Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla. And we believe that one of those people may hold the clue. We think that they knew maybe they foreshadowed or forethought that all of their discoveries in science from radio and the transmission of energy and this type na nature of their technology that they were developing that we might come in contact with alien races. And we believe it's possible that they might have developed countermeasures for this. That's why he kept saying, you know, atomic weapons won't work and Tesla and Edison knew. It's possible that either Tesla, Edison, or both um, attempted to build said device. Um, there are no, We're leaning towards Tesla because there's nothing in Thomas Edison's notes that allude to death rays, death weapons, weapons of mass destruction. But there are quite a lot of notes towards that when it comes to Nikola Tesla. And he also forwarded many plans to the, to the Department of War in England before the outbreak of World War, the, the, the main outbreak of World War II before his death. So we assume that he did create this device. It is possible, and to be quite honest, I'm leaning towards go ahead and try an atomic weapon. Probably won't work. He probably wasn't lying. It may be impossible for him to lie. It may not be in his nature. Um, it, it just, I don't know where else to go with this. Just take the leads as they're given to me. But I will tell you this. I know that they have Nikola Tesla's notes, and I know that no functioning death ray was ever found in those notes, just plans for one, potentially. I think Mr. Tesla did create that weapon, and I think the reason we don't have said weapon, or why we don't have record of it, is he built it, destroyed the notes, and he carried it on him. I also believe the reason it never came up or, or turned up when he died was because he gave it to me. 